I am the French ambassador to Sweden, <laughs> and I sometimes wonder, just like everybody else, if I will eventually be replaced by artificial intelligence. In fact, I believe AI is the greatest threat, but also the greatest opportunity for diplomacy. The opportunity to scale it up from the current specific practice of a tiny group of professionals like me, to the general cooperation between millions of stakeholders to address our shared global challenges. But I want to start by pointing out the deep irony in the fact that diplomats should fear robots. Because for centuries, they were the closest thing you could find to a robot. <laughs> no, really. They were supposed to think in a very cold and analytical way in order to cancel the noise of human emotions and to manage state relations efficiently. That's how Cardinal de Richelieu, the great minister of King Louis XIII during the Thirty Years' War, could determine that the best interest of Catholic France required an alliance with Protestant Sweden against Catholic Austria. Something that was outrageous from the point of view of ideology or religion, made perfect sense from the point of view of state interest. That's also the reason why the rules of modern diplomacy were designed to constrain emotions. The, dip the diplomatic protocol codifies interactions between states and even the expression of feelings to make sure that there is no overreaction, no miscalculation. And all countries rotate their diplomats on a regular basis, usually three, four years, in large part because they don't want them to become too emotionally involved in their country of residence. Uh, to suffer, you'll forgive me for saying so, from the famous Stockholm uh, syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the reason why, to this day, the worst, the worst possible thing a diplomat can say about another diplomat is that he or she is very passionate. <laughs> because <laughs> Because diplomats like to see themselves as relying on reason, not emotion, on careful, factual, objective analysis, not on prejudice, and on patience, and not agitation. That's why they like the closed-door meetings when they can interact with each other rationally, almost scientifically. And that's the reason why they even like the fact that nobody actually really understands how diplomacy works just like a computer. <laughs> but that diplomat, the robot diplomat, is leaving the stage, pushed out slowly but surely by the real machines. Let me tell you how. When I started in this job more than 20 years ago, we had no emails, no internet in our offices. And as I was sent to my first posting in Armenia, there was remarkably little that I could read about the current situation of that country at the time, except in diplomatic telegrams. Now you have a lot more information available just a few clicks away. Data processing was cumbersome, very paper-intensive, labor-intensive, which gave a big advantage to the countries whose bureaucracies were bigger and better organized. And similarly, there was a great advantage to the individuals who could absorb more data, memorize it, store it, reuse it at the right time. And we were all fancying ourselves, the diplomats, as great chess masters with impressive memories. But now computers are beating humans at, uh, at chess, at games like Go. They are beating us even at piloting a spacecraft. And this will continue. Computers will increasingly take on an, uh, an advisory role. In, in uh, meetings, leaders already tend to turn to their smartphone rather than to their advisor. And soon, instead of somebody whispering in their ear, they'll have a machine helping them in real time, fact-checking the, the issues, warning them about the mistakes to avoid, providing them with scenarios, recommendations. And finally, when it comes to negotiating the most noble part of diplomacy, it will probably be more difficult for the machines to completely take over because negotiations involve political judgment and accountability. 
But still, the biggest part of nego any negotiating process, actually the diplomatic part, relies on assessing data, anticipating outcomes, evaluating respective strengths and interests. Exactly the kind, of, the kind of game at which AI may become quite good, much faster than we think. So in any case, machines will always be better than humans at being artificial. <laughs> and that's actually fine. We should have no regrets, because being artificial is not so useful in diplomacy anymore. Why? Because the world is changing. Robotic diplomacy made sense in a specific context, a context in which information was the most precious and scarce commodity, exploited by a limited number of people, representing an even more limited number of key states. People who shared the same language. I cannot fail to mention that that language for a long time was French. <laughs> <laughs> and people who, who, who agreed on the same basic rules of behavior. You could say we had similar hardware sharing the same software. That was the world of the elitist world of diplomatic Europe in the 19th century, a world that was glued together by the fear of popular uprisings against autocracy. But it was also the world of the Cold War. That world was glued together by the fear of nuclear war. But it's not our world. Our world has no gloom. Our world has no clue, because digitalization is disrupting power, ideas, flattening everything out, leaving people unsure what to hold on to. Organization is regressing, just as the technology continues to progress. And for governments, there is no longer one overwhelming existential fear that instills discipline and pushes towards cooperation. Instead, there are plenty of competing fears floating around that it is so tempting for extremists and populists to use, offering simplistic solutions, always revolving around some macho leader who presents himself as the savior. In this world, technology is actually increasing the polarization. We see how it's easier to, to have a thousand or 10,000 followers on Twitter through negative messaging, than 1,000 or 100 through positive tweets. And we see how AI is already being used to spread disinformation, destabilize societies, influence elections. And we are collectively sliding, sleepwalking into a very dangerous political, legal, moral vacuum, what some call the post-truth era. So in this world, in that era, we don't need diplomats to pretend that they are robots to run the world like some kind of computer. We need diplomats to use the power of robots to save humanity from itself. And there are two things we must do. First, we must embrace the technology to mobilize people towards cooperation, regulation, negotiation, away from confrontation. Connectivity by itself is not enough for people to connect. They must be engaged around issues that appeal to their interests, but also to their sense of purpose, to our, to our willingness to be part of something bigger than ourselves. And actually, if you look around, in including starting in this room, you can feel the tremendous energy waiting to be tapped into. Let me give you a couple of examples. Just as the US, has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, we see citizens, NGOs, businesses, local authorities, academics, energized like never before, including in the US, to implement it. Just as the European Union is facing probably the greatest threats from inside and from outside since its creation, we see Europeans supporting this great political project in greater numbers than ever before. And just as social and economic inequalities have been allowed through decades by active and passive governments to reach very dangerous levels, we see business increasingly interested in developing a more sustainable model in order to attract 
customers to their products and their services, but also to attract talent into their companies. So we must turn these initiatives and these aspirations into governance. And that's where diplomats working with AI can make the difference. In my job here as ambassador, I'm wondering every day who and how I should engage, how I can use this, best, this great asset that I still have, which is that I can talk to anyone, anywhere in France and Sweden, to build a stronger constituency for French, Swedish, European cooperation. And I really look forward to the day when AI allows me to do this much more systematically and efficiently. The second thing we should do is to make sure that the technology is open to all. Because AI can make the powerful even more powerful, it can make the world even more polarized, or it can level the international playing field and provide the weaker parties with diplomatic resources they could previously not even dream of. So imagine a negotiation where you have thousands of stakeholders, big and small, national, local, public, private, who would have a common platform available to all and run by a powerful algorithm that would help them define and build coalitions of a new type. You could have the mayor of Gothenburg, prime minister of Singapore, Russian environmental activist, Mexican CEO, joining forces to develop, for instance, a new model for sustainable city planning. Imagine the power of such coalitions to address in a comprehensive, holistic way challenges like migrations, developments, pandemics, poverty, cyber threats, terrorism. In fact, if you think about it, only such coalitions will be able to provide the answers to these challenges. But this will not happen by itself. It will not happen by itself. If we've learned one thing since the invention of the printing press, is that every new technology sees its negative potential, exploited, developed before the positive one, for a very, very simple reason, that it is so much easier. So we can break this pattern with AI, but it depends on all of us. And we diplomats, we should be grateful, because this great struggle will unlock our humanity. It will put it back at the core of everything we do. We will be left with what we had in the beginning, in the pre-robotic diplomatic times the drive to engage people, to convince them that polarization is a dead end, and the fight against all those who want to lock us up into one identity instead of searching for common ground. And so we will be forced out of our black cars and our black suits and our black ties to embrace the world in its amazing diversity. Thank you. Thank you.